I'd like to welcome a journalist, Graham Lee Brewer, and thank him for hosting this hour-long presentation. Um, it's going to be a kind of a Q&A and presentation combo. And he is a Cherokee Nation citizen, associate editor for Indigenous Affairs at High Country News, and a contributor to NPR and the New York Times. With that, I will let Graham take it away. Thanks. Um, I think I know most of you to those I don't. Uh, hello, nice to meet you. Um, I, uh, I, I'll try to keep the PowerPoint short because I know, like I said, some of you have stuff to do so we can get to Q&A if you have any and um, I'm willing to stick around a little bit longer if you need to. So uh, let me share my screen. And if you guys have any questions along the way, just let me know. Um, can you guys see that? Okay, okay, cool. Well, I wonder if I can. Sorry. It's been a while since I've done this. Oh, there we go. That's what I'm looking for. There we are. All right. Um, so um, real quickly, I, I like to start these, especially for national desks, to just kind of remind them that um, that we're not as different as they might think. And so I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the Cherokee Phoenix, which is still in print today, uh, although it's it wasn't for a while and, and it morphed back into the Phoenix. But this is the Phoenix from 1828. And um, I just like to point out that uh, we as a, as a people have been performing newspaper journalism uh, exceptionally uh, 25 years longer than the New York Times and about half a century before the Washington Post. Um, and um, I like to make note of the masthead because uh, the paper wasn't just a means for news, but it was a form of protection against uh, genocide and violence because it was a way for the Cherokee people to show the Georgians and the Tennesseans and the people who were taking their land that they were, um, that they deserved humanity and respect. Um, there's a lot of forms of journalism that have a lot of uh, ties to Oklahoma that predate uh, what we know as American journalism. Um, this is a ledger drawing from um, a Kiowa artist. Um, as many of you I'm sure know, the Kiowa tribe is, is headquartered here in Southwestern Oklahoma. Um, the Kiowa have been um, documenting their lives through uh, illustrations since time immemorial. I think it's kind of funny that today we call this like graphic journalism, graphic novel journalism, and we have kind of branded it as this like new thing, but the Kiowa as a people have been doing it since long before this country even existed. I like this particular example because um, many of you might be familiar with General Pratt, who was famous for the saying, kill the Indian, save the man. He was the father of the Indian boarding schools and uh, it was his goal to fully assimilate uh, Native Americans um, and essentially um, erase their culture and traditions and make them as, as white uh, and American, quote unquote, as possible. So this is a drawing, a ledger drawing take, made by a prisoner who is depicted in the, in the uh, uh, drawing. And it's, it's a group of Kiowa. And I think there was some maybe Quapaw and Comanche um, and Seminole prisoners mixed up. And they were, I think this is at Fort Augustine and um, General Pratt would make them dress up in their regalia and dance for people who came to ogle at them. This particular example is interesting because if you are a descendant of one of these people depicted in the drawing, uh, my friend Tristan Otto, my former editor, his, one of his ancestors is in here. This is the only form of true journalism that's gonna tell you about who your family was and what they went through. If you look at uh, illustrations that were done for the evening newspapers, like for Harper's Magazine, um, they were very much one-sided. Um, they depicted people as savages. So, you know, just one year later, um, this is a, a drawing that was made for the evening newspapers of, of Custer's Last Stand. So um, I would argue that if you were Kiowa, this is a better form of journalism for your purposes than this is. Um, and so, um, you know, this, and then years later, I think a lot of you have probably seen Edward Curtis's work. It's been on display here in Norman at the University of Oklahoma multiple times. Um, Curtis took some really breathtaking and beautiful photos around the turn of the century, um, but, but he dressed people, he asked people to dress in regalia that didn't necessarily match their cultural uh, identity or the uh, situation that they were in. 
And, and he did the other things like, uh, as you can see in the original image on the right, there's a clock in between these two men and in the image that was eventually published, Curtis removed it. Um, he did a lot of harm because he, he solidified this image of uh, indigenous peoples as antiquated um, and um, you know barbaric and in, in a certain way and unintelligent, um, unequipped for a modern world. And those images kind of, these images help define how we as a country look at indigenous people and understand what they're capable of and who they are. Um, but this is a photo taken here in Oklahoma in the 1920s by Thomas Pula. Pula was a, a Kiowa photographer. And um, this is a group of Kiowa women who were returning to the, the then reservation um, with a group of, uh, or with a, a bunch of gifts wrapped for Christmas. I think it's a really great photo. It is indigenous journalism at its finest. It's made by indigenous people for indigenous people. And I would argue that, again, this is the, those make up the best representations of who indigenous people really are. Um, I think the author N. Scott Mamaday, a Pulitzer Prize winner from Oklahoma, is another really good example. I think his book, The Way to Rainy Mountain, about the origin stories of the Kiowa people is is, is, is a form of journalism too. Um, I think we, I, I really like it when places like Reveal and um, other really interesting podcasts like challenge our conceptions of who can make journalism by like giving a 15 year old a microphone and having her tell her story during the pandemic. So um, I would just argue, yeah, like these are really interesting forms of journalism if you just look at them in a different way. So to kind of catch us up to a modern sense, I think these are the three lenses that we try as a, at Naja as an organization to remind people to look at their stories in Indian country. So the first two, I don't have to explain to anybody in this room. Um, you know, the who, when, or why. The second one is why are we here? What makes this situation unique? But the third one, I think, is something that we don't often consider enough. Um, and early in my career, I was guilty of this too. Um, and it is what is the overall impact of colonialism. One of my favorite examples is um, the LA Times did a story several years ago about a village in Kansas that had unearthed some ruins underneath it. It was this small town. And the lead in that graph was essentially, there's a tiny little town in Southern Kansas and there was always rumors of a town underneath it. And if you were looking at that from an indigenous perspective, the lead would be there's a tiny little town in Texas and somebody built a town on top of it. And um, so I think you have to consider not just physically, but philosophically, culturally, how has colonialism shaped the picture we're looking at? I would argue that Indian Health Services is, isn't quote unquote underfunded. That is the United States Congress willfully breaking the law when it decides that it's not gonna fully fulfill its treaty obligations to maintain the health of indigenous peoples. Um, so I think under, calling it underfunded while technically true is also kind of missing the broader picture, which was the third lens. So I really like this example from the New York Times. And I will, I will openly admit, and I've said this to, to them in many occasions, that the New York Times does, um, I think, among the poorest jobs of covering Indian country of any national outlet in, in, in America, they do a very bad job. Um, and, uh, and so, but, you know, I, I, I think they're trying and they're learning in some ways, but there's a lot of work to be made up because they have a very long history of doing a bad job. Um, this story is only, you know, nine years old, I guess now, um, but it's a story about how crime has ramped up on the Wind River Indian Reservation. And I would just like to note that even in the headline of the story, we're, we're coming off very vague. Um, an Indian Reservation, I think, is way too way too vague. You need to, you need to give these nations the respect that a sovereign nation deserves and use their name in, a he, in every headline. The Associated Press, for instance, has, that's, and, and in fact, when you don't do that, it's a, you're breaking the Associated Press's style guide uh, because we lobbied very hard for many years to get them to make this change. And they finally did a couple years ago. So to use N. Scott Mamaday, for example, again, you wouldn't say Native American author in Scott Mamaday, you would say Kiowa author in Scott Mamaday. It respects his identity and the fact that he's a citizen of a sovereign nation. Um, but this article uh, kind of lays out some pretty um, bleak um, statistics. And there's a, I had, 
sorry, I have my notes in here. I have like this one pull quote from it. Crime may be Wind River's most pressing problem, but it has plenty of company. Life, even by the grim standards of the typical American Indian reservation, is as bleak and punishing as that of any developing country. And then it has a paragraph with the life expectancy statistics, the suicide rates, the alcohol rates, um, poverty rates. Um, it basically paints this bleak picture that, that violence is an intrinsic part of living in the Wind River Indian Reservation. And so, um, and, and, but what, the, what this article failed to really talk about was that according to the Department of Justice, 60% of Native American victims describe their attacker as white. 60%, like that's a pretty staggering number, right? And so there's a really, really good reason for that. And anyone here who has been covering McGirt understands what I'm about to say, which is that federal, uh, according to federal law, the federal prosecutors have jurisdiction in these cases. I think, I think the number is slightly better now. I wanna say that 45% of cases of violent cases in Indian country are declined for prosecution, which is up from or down from 50% just a few years before. But I mean, if you could just imagine if 45% of the cases in your town that were of violence, like murder, rape, were declined for prosecution, I think you would find that statistic pretty troubling. And But the New York Times article doesn't talk about that at all. Instead, they blame the problem, literally blame the problem on ghosts. So they like turn this community into like pet cemetery essentially. And so I, I just think that, that, you know, that's not ghosts, that's broken federal policy and predators taking advantage of it. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar now with the Oliphant decision, the Supreme Court decision from 1978 that established this whole system that tribes can't prosecute non-native people on their own reservations. So um, it's, it's an ongoing problem. And, and if, I think if you look at the Victims Violence Against Women Act and how it's used as a political football, how easy it is to, to disregard the, the lives of indigenous people, it, it, it's troubling that the journalism at the paper of record would, would blame that violence on ghosts. But I would argue that the, this, the, these are the depictions that those audiences are primed for because they've seen the John Ford Westerns, um, they've, they've read the comics and, and these, these images are like foundational documents in the American story. So just look at the creative staging of this painting, which I'm sure you've all seen. You know, you put Native Americans on the ground with dogs and children being handed food by the, you know, the generous pilgrims. When we, we know today that that is not what happened. Um, but again, the, the, these, these images of like manifest destiny, they're necessary to like further that narrative that makes it okay to take and take native land. Um, and, and we see it manifest most in popular culture and the media in really kind of two specific ways traditionally. Um, oh, and just real quickly, this, there's a really great book called Indians Illustrated that John Coward, who just retired from the University of Tulsa wrote. Um, John's a really, really, really wonderful man and a great resource. He's on Twitter. He'll respond to you if you ever want to talk to him. Um, he, uh, he has this in one of his uh, chapters. And in 2006, the Fort Worth Star-Telegram asked its readers to pick a painting that was exhibited in the city of Dallas or Fort Worth that most embodied what it meant to be Texan and American. And this is the photo they picked. It's a, it's a, a uh, Remington painting called A Dash for the Timber. And it's, um, you can see it's these uh, cowboys running from a, a group of charging natives. And so I, I think it's just like really interesting that, that people in Fort Worth like think that, that that's the American ideal. Like that's what defines us as a people um, is this conflict between cowboys and Indians. Um, but violence is really the first one. And then again, we see sex. And so this paper magazine cover is just four years old. And the story of Pocahontas, who was a child and you know, was essentially taken and trafficked, um, you, this, I, this is just a very clear example of just how easy it is to get away with this when it comes to native people. If you look at the mascot issue, uh, you just, you can, in any, in any instance of the degradation of indigenous people in the media, it's pretty easy to ask yourself, would we do this for any other ethnicity? And the answer is almost always no. Um, a lot of you probably saw this when you were young reporters or in college, like myself, when this was, uh, or I guess, yeah, 
college, uh, maybe uh, a little bit of both. Uh, when uh, the baby Veronica case, I, I cropped out the photo at this because I just thought like, I just think it's important for us to like take a moment and just appreciate the fact that the Washington Post, instead of understanding that this was a question of adoption through two nations, like if you adopt a Russian child, you have to deal with the government of Russia, right? Um, instead of recognizing that simple fact, they were literally asking in the pages of their paper whether or not this girl was white or native and then having a photo of her. Uh, I just think that's uh, like so gross. I don't know how to describe it. And then an another case that you're probably familiar with here in Oklahoma is Elizabeth Warren's claims to native identity. This is a clip from the Boston Globe where they are literally openly speculating about the degree of native blood that could exist inside of Elizabeth Warren's body. Again, I don't, I don't know of another ethnicity that we would do this for. So I think, I think it's just important to remember that there's a good reason why native communities don't trust the media uh, historically. Um, so there's another way that some of these misconceptions kind of manifest themselves in modern media. And it's that builds on top of violence and sex, and that is a uh, plight, the plight of the Indian. Um, so these are two rules that I think are really helpful. Um, so the WD4 rule, Duncan McHugh, who's a really great broadcaster in Canada um, and a teacher um, in uh, the um, uh, that teaches a class on reporting in Indigenous communities. This is a rule he Duncan came up with, and it's basically like the four, the five ways that you see Indigenous people in the news. Um, and if you look, if you go look back and look at the Standing Rock coverage, you will find this rule littered all throughout it. You'll see a drum circle, you'll see people dancing around it, you'll see B-roll of some poor, uh, that, that New York Times video that just came out about the Cherokee Nation vaccinating people for the New York Times opinion page, it literally had B-roll of like poor Native people living in trailers. Like, it just blew my mind. And I think the, the, the B-roll didn't look new, it looked really old too. Um, the warrior uh, concept, uh, drinking is often one, and then um, suicide, death statistics, things like that. Um, if you look up um, in data on indigenous people, it also kind of, it's not, they're not neutral entities. Um, so they, they always fall into one of these categories, unless that data is compiled by an indigenous tribe or an indigenous nonprofit or like a native led group, you'll almost always find that it falls into one of these categories. There's really not a lot of data on like division of household labor and native families and just things like that, that you can find for like literally any other racial demographic. And, and you'll often find that on <laughs> racial breakdown, like data charts from national outlets that native American doesn't even like exist. You, you probably all saw like the CNN thing where they just said something else and like indigenous people just kind of like ran with it. And now there's like all these t-shirts and stuff that just say like something else, but. Um, my, I think my favorite example of this, I'm going to pick on the Washington Post again, is their, their poll about whether or not the name of the, the former name of the football team in Washington, D.C. is offensive. So they, they called like five or 600 self-identified Native Americans across the country. And so I would argue that like, well, I don't see the necessity of asking a group of marginalized people if a racial slur meant to further marginalize them is offensive. Like, I don't think that's a neutral piece of data. Like, I think that's very biased. And furthermore, you're the Washington Post. You've never ever done a nationwide poll of Native Americans. And this is the first time you're doing it. And that's the question you want to ask them. Again, I don't think that that's a, a neutral piece of data. Um, so uh, I'll kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll get through the Standing Rock piece really quick. I think Standing Rock like really kind of helped shape and define how a lot of us look at news from Indian country. And it's a really good example of how poorly it can be done. Um, you know, we saw a lot of this, I think like the Bloomberg headline was like the Sioux tribe fears the black snake prophecy or something like that. Um, but this is a story that was just like sitting there waiting to be told because it existed in court documents. If you've read Nick Estes's book, uh, our history is the future. Uh, Nick is Lakota. He was at Standing Rock. He's an incredible writer. Um, it's a wonderful book. I highly recommend it. Um, there was, um, you know, really heated tribal council meetings where oil pipeline executives or representatives were coming and people were telling them they didn't want them there. I mean, this story has existed like two years before it ever hit the press. But uh, uh, 
reporters who care about a community are the ones who are looking at those government documents and court memos. And nobody was paying attention to the Standing Rock Sioux, um, not until it got sexy. And it was an interesting story and there was rubber bullets and everything that we saw. Indigenous people live in more or less, they like live in Americans' imaginations. Standing Rock was cowboys versus Indians. It was, um, it was described as anything I think than what it really was, which is a story that American journalism helped create. It wasn't cowboys versus Indians. It was a story of what the government will do um, for private land. And I'll, I'll, I'll I, I think it's also a really good example of how uh, reporters stole from that community. So stories in Indian country, it, I mean, we're not a monolith, so every community is different, but stories are viewed as a resource. There's something that's protected. If you can imagine, and it wasn't until 1978, just um, not that long ago, that it was legal to like have your uh, religious and cultural rights protected as an indigenous person. It wasn't until Jimmy Carter signed that into law. So essentially, to tell stories like Te Ata did, um, that was a form of protest because what she was doing was illegal. Like it was like literally illegal for her to tell the stories of her history. And so, um, so when you now come into a store and steal a story or repackage it, get it wrong, and then you sell it to your audience, you're taking a resource and that isn't any different than the mining or the logging industry. It's, it's a form of exploitation colonialism. And so you have to, you have to be super aware of what you're doing and what you're saying and like the history here, that third lens, how colonialism has shaped the situation because you don't wanna to contribute to that. Um, and then just lastly, I'll just touch on imagery. I think it's really important in our stories. This is, um, you know, obviously like a, a fancy dance at a powwow, but um, if, if your character um, in your story, if like this image or this situation is really integral to the telling of the story, then by all means use it. But if you're just looking for like a colorful image of a native community, you, you apply the same ethical standard to that community that you would your own. Um, and so um, I, I actually, actually, I'll be really curious to know if anyone does. I always ask this question, does anybody know who, it, who is depicted in this image? And I'll give you a hint. This is the oldest photo ever taken in what is now the state of Oklahoma. It was actually taken before statehood um, in the 1860s. I think, or, no, I think it's the 1840s actually, sorry. But according to the Library of Congress this is the oldest photo in Oklahoma history. Does anybody happen to know who that is? If you do, you can just say it, but no one's ever guessed it. I just thought maybe since this is Oklahoma group. John Ross? Yes, oh, Cliff, Cliff coming in, <laughs> nice. Well done, sir. All right. <laughs> I, I'm gonna buy you a beer, Cliff. <laughs> Um, this is John Ross. This is what the chief of our tribe looked like during the Trail of Tears. He was a diplomat and a scholar, and he personally lobbied, um, let's see, I don't, know, I don't know, countless members of Congress, the president, to stop the Trail of Tears. And so I just think it's a really good reminder that, you know, this probably challenges some of your conceptions of what Indigenous people looked like back then, although I will admit the Cherokee Nation was different because we were already very much inter, intermarried with white, uh, white settlers at that point. Um, but um, this is native stock, uh, doc, I think it's native stock.com, but it's a, it's a website that exists that just shows native people like doing regular things like, you know, graduating from high school, testing lab results, being a doctor. This website shouldn't have to exist, but if you go to like Getty Images or something, I literally pulled this off the front page of stockphoto.com a few years ago when I typed in Native American. So if you're like an editor, you know, late at night and you've got to put the paper to bed and you need an image of a Native community and you don't know any better and you're just looking around, you're probably not going to find this, you know, on stock photo or Getty Images. Um, you're going to find something like this. So just be really mindful of the imagery you use um, and just ask yourself, like, is this image fair to this story? And is it the same kind of image I would use for a story, a similar story in my own community? Um, I'll leave you with just the fact that on the uh, Naja website under the resources tab, we have some uh, really great resources. Uh, Trace was kind enough to link to the indigenous uh, tribal nations media guide that we built recently um, 
And it's kind of like a, a guy, like if you want to know how to cover the indigenous nations in your, in your area, it's kind of like a questionnaire to fill out for each tribe. It kind of makes you think about them as governments and communities. And, um, and then also just don't forget that there's tons of tribal media here in Oklahoma and all over the country that do really impressive work. Um, I think the Cheyenne Arapaho television station does some amazing stuff. Um, uh, those of you in Tulsa probably see a lot of OCO on your television. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff. FNX, it comes through, I think, uh, OETA as well. And FNX is basically like PBS, but for Indian country, it's really cool. Um, and then APTN in Canada is like FNX on steroids. It's, it's incredible. It's super well-funded and has a lot of interesting programs. Um, Muskoka Media does great stuff too. Like there's just tons of stuff out there. So um, yeah, that's it. And I went through that faster than I ever have. So I hope I didn't go too quick. And, um, but that leaves us with plenty of time for questions. Thank you, Graham. We recorded this and we can share it with the other members. Uh, do you guys have any questions for Graham? Go ahead. Let me go ahead and break the ice here. Uh, talk a little bit about, so you, you referenced the blood quantum issue and that we don't really do that for any other ethnicity. So obviously you're talking about something where you would disclose the percentage for somebody. And, and that's, I didn't realize until this week that that was something that was uh, uncouth. So just to talk about that a little bit more. Well, you know, I, I'll put it this way. My entire, and I'm, you know, my father's white, my, my mother's native. And so like, I get to walk out my front door every day and I get to choose how I want to identify. That's a privilege that a lot of my cousins don't have. Um, and so my entire life, I have been asked the question repeatedly, how native are you? How much native are you? And I, it, it's always made me uncomfortable, but now that I'm older, I, I, I find the best response to that question is, why is that distinction important to you? And like I said in the presentation, what other ethnicity do you ask that question of? And quite frankly, don't you feel weird asking it? Like, I don't know, like, it just seems like a weird question to me. But I think it's a question that people feel comfortable asking because they've been told that it matters. If Elizabeth Warren was a part of our community and she could prove her lineage and it was well documented, like it is for most of the rest of us, I know it's not always easy, um, then it wouldn't have mattered how much blood is in her veins because we would have accepted her as a Cherokee. And like we have freedmen, the 1867 treaty also allows Shawnee and Delaware descendants to be Cherokee. So it's not a question of race, it's a question of nationality. Um, and I think that's the distinction like the Washington Post missed in the baby Veronica case, for instance. So, yeah. I have a question. Go ahead. I, I never ask questions, so. <laughs> but you're special, Graham. So you talked about how like kind of like stereotypical coverage of native communities, but what issues do you see that aren't getting enough coverage? Uh, you know, I think, this might be an easy answer to that question, but I think a lot of what constitutes a story in Indian country is like based on the idea of plight or tragedy. So we, we I think, you know, we call it parachute journalism. And um, I don't think parachute journalism is always a bad thing, but in Indian country, it's really hard because if you're only showing up to show deprivation, then you're not giving your readers a fully formed vision of who these people are as a community. So like um, when the New York Times does their thing like where they drop into the Klamath River tribes and say like, they don't have access to the salmon and their opioid abuse is really high. So the two things must be correlated. And then and then the New York Times readers of the, of the paper, that's the only perspective they have of that entire community. And so like when you and I, when you and I were at the Oklahoman, one of the things I did to get people to talk to me about the prison system was I just like went to support group meetings. And I went to them knowing I am not gonna get a story out of this and I'm gonna spend my Sunday on my own time, like just going to learn. And that led me to so many good stories. It led to that fight club story with uh, uh, Avalon. And uh, 
because people just, they recognized that I was there just to hear them out, not to like take things from them, um, but to like listen to what they'll give me. And so if you show up to, one of the things Tristan always says is uh, uh, go to two powwows, go to two protests, go to two funerals, go to two, you know, celebrations, go to two basketball games, um, just go and show them that you want to be there. And then I think it'll lead you to what those stories that are missing are because um, because again, like if, if our only view of Indian country for a story perspective story is one where something bad happened to these people, then, um, then I think you're missing out. And, and I should have said this in the thing, but like, and you guys have probably heard me say this a lot, just those of you who like listen to me rant about journalism in your free time, uh, is that we should be writing for these communities and not about them. And that's typically the lens we do is about and not for. So I think for McGird, it kind of represents a challenge for us because we're like, well, we need to explain to non-native people like what we're even talking about because they don't even understand sovereignty. Um, but you should also be asking yourself, if I was a citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation, what questions would I want to know? And I think that's not something that typically occurs, like um, at least not enough. I'm seeing it more and more. Uh, and I think I think people are more aware of like, I think the gaming issue particularly like showed Oklahomans like just how intertwined the governments of tribal and the state are like tribal governments in the state are like and how tribal governments like are responsible for road building and hospitals and things like that like so I, I see I, I can see the shift in the coverage like in a positive way um, but I still think that like those communities are historically the some of the most underserved and they're not always getting their questions answered and 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 their tribal media doesn't always have the freedom to do that. So Muskoka Media, for instance, they're lucky because they have been successful in battling their tribal administration to try to take their press freedoms away. There's a firewall there, but other other papers are still run by the tribal administration. So um, yeah, I don't know. Sorry, that's kind of a long answer, but. Thanks. What other questions do you have? Graham, what kind of opportunity do you think we have working with tribal media uh, to maybe move the needle with the press freedom? And we do have the codification of First Amendment coming with the Muscogee Creeks in November, but uh, what opportunity do you see with us training or mentoring some of these journalists within the tribes than their own media? I think anytime, I think, I know definitely at High Country News, we've learned that in order to survive the current moment, partnerships are kind of a huge part of that deal. And I see that all over like Oklahoma with like, you know, the public media exchange and a lot of you guys are teaming up like the frontier it, it, that Cassie and Catherine doing their story together, things like that. I, I think that's all really healthy and good. And you, there's no reason you can't do that with people like the Muscogee uh, Creek Nation or like the Cherokee Phoenix, like Will Chavez, really top notch reporter. All of the reporting that I read about Scorsese and DiCaprio, I get from the Osage News because Shannon Shaw Duty covers that story from the Gray Horse community in the best way that nobody else can do. Um, and Shannon, by the way, is just like a brilliant journalist. So there's, I think there's a lot of really good opportunities there. But I also think kind of added to that is that the more you work with those papers, and like legitimize them through your own publications, I think the, the stronger their cases are to have press freedoms within their own tribes. Because like, if you're a tribal chief, what incentive do you have to let your tribal newspaper cover you in a critical way? You don't, but at Naja, like we joined forces with the uh, Muskoka media staff and like really put pressure on, on the chief and the um, uh, tribal council to like not take those press freedoms away. And so, um, yeah, I think like working with them and it, it gives them a stronger case that they're legitimate journalists who deserve those press freedoms. Because I, I mean, no one, I'm sure no one here would want to work in a newsroom where your, your stories are, are dictated to you. You know, Rebecca at Naja, the executive director, she suggested we consider co-hosting an event with Naja, have OMC media members and some of the tribal media members. Uh, we're going to have some discussions in between on that, but we'd really like to see our OMC journalists and the tribal journalists talking through some of these questions at a future event, maybe breaking down some of the silos. 
So think about ways we can do that. And uh, I know we do have Muskoka is interested in, in being a partner and we've reached out to Shannon at Osage as well and talked to some of their board. And uh, of course we have Lindsay and uh, Cliff and you Graham and, and different people uh, with tribal coverage experience. So um, that's, that should be an exciting opportunity in the future. What other questions you guys have? I've got one kind of like a, like a tangible example, I guess. So like um, this year, the legislature, and I guess last year too, they have been working on several bills that have to do with missing and murdered indigenous people and trying to um, you know, essentially make a, prog a process for law enforcement to work through to um, help deal with that issue. And so I wonder like looking at it through that tangible example, like if I wanted to write a story about that or cover that, like, do you see any just off the top of your head kind of pitfalls that I might fall into when it comes to like reporting on that issue and doing it from, you know, a, a perspective of a white person that might miss some things? Yeah, totally. Like <clears throat> the thing about that kind of coverage that I think I see the most is that it always follows the same formula, which is that it's very focused on like a victim, a particular victim, and then the family's response. But like what I what I think, I think the healthier and smarter way to approach those stories is to approach them as, as accountability stories within the police department and the prosecution. Because like um, a lot of those cases, like if you just dig, you'll find that a lot of the reasons those cases don't make their way to prosecution is like really based off stereotype. Like historically, especially like if you're looking at a case, particularly from like the 80s or 90s, they're, you know, they're littered with language like, well, who was she hanging out with? You know, she has a reputation for drinking. And like, um, and it's like, it's kind of, it's based on these like really like racist stereotypes and myths. And so, um, yeah, so like, I, I think like those stories, we did one at HCN when I was like first starting on the Indigenous Affairs Desk about Olivia, I think it was Olivia Lone Bear. And like, and we really, and we, Jacqueline Keeler wrote it for us and we really made Jacqueline like focus on the police department because their narrative was so like it was just so bad like and it was littered with like all sorts of language like that and so the family wasn't being held to the same standard and so we were trying to answer that question as like well why like why are they why are they being treated differently and and it's really easy to find like I think you if you talk to a like a light horse police officer in Eastern Oklahoma and you talk to like maybe a Shawnee or Tecumseh police officer, I, I would be willing to bet that their, their basic understanding of like tribal jurisdiction is probably pretty fundamentally different. Well, Shawnee and Tecumseh is maybe a bad example because those cops are probably pretty well versed in it because they live on the border of two. But, um, but I, I think you see what I mean, like tribal police officers are gonna understand those more basic questions. And so, like, it doesn't surprise me that a lot of these cases fall through the cracks um, or that like uh, police data is a real big problem. So like native women in particular are often categorized as Hispanic or white. And so like even, and, and, and I guarantee you, you will never find a police department who categorizes their tribal victims by tribe. And so no tribal leader in the state of Oklahoma can definitively tell you how many of their people are missing or how many of them have been murdered because they had, they don't know themselves because the data is not fair. It's not, it's not equitable. Um, and so that's a huge problem too. In fact, like the city of Seattle, there was like this big study um, done by the Seattle, I think uh, Indian urban Indian Institute or, um, I can't remember the acronym, but anyway, they did this study a few years ago and they, it was most, mostly in the West and like the city of Seattle gave them all this data and then had to resend it because the word N in their database didn't mean native, it meant Negro. And like, they didn't know that until like the mid eighties when they changed it. And so like all of the data was bad because then they were like, okay, well now we actually don't know. Um, and so it just kind of gives you an idea of just like how easy it is to ignore these communities. If they don't exist in the data, then they don't exist. That was a good question. And Graham, that made me think a little bit of Allison Herrera, who was on our last call and, and works with you. She was talking about her passion for covering crimes against Indigenous women and the Violence Against Women Act. And uh, I'll put her chat information in here, or put her information in the chat here. 
um, because I would encourage everybody to work together and collaborate. I know some broadcast media has already reached out to Allison about possibly partnering here. And uh, moving forward, as you guys at the Frontier, Oklahoma Watch, Oklahoma, and, uh, and all, all the entities represented here, you guys are pillars of investigative journalism for the state. And with OMC, we'd like to help with a possible part-time data journalist position. Think about ways that could help supplement and complement your coverage. So that's something in the future. Um, any other questions for Graham as, as we move forward? And you guys can always, you guys all know me. It's like, you can reach out to me anytime, just text me. Um, just remember, I think if I can leave you with one thought, just remember that colonialism isn't an event in our past. It's a structure that we still live inside of today. And so it, in, it informs government policy um, in, in countless ways. All right, thank you, Graham. And, and please keep in mind, we have not named the McGirt series. So uh, there's a Google link in this week's update. You can vote if you haven't. Maybe Graham has a good idea for a name we can call it. I don't know, but <laughs> not to put you on the spot, but uh, we really do appreciate your time. And uh, hey, I just want to say, hey, Sherm, I didn't know you were there until you, I just saw your video. So it's good to see you. Good to see you, Graham. Sorry I didn't ask a question. I was just listening, but I wanted to say, and I've got a crazy dog barking in the background. So um, the one thing I just ask, I think what you're saying in, is uh, something our whole staff needs to hear, you know, rather than just... Uh, so I, I was going to touch base with you and see if uh, there might be a Thursday for lunch. We could uh, do a Zoom like this and, and, and knock it around a bit. And yeah, sure. Just you know how to get a hold of me. So just anytime. Your, uh, your, your comments about writing for an audience rather than about it, rather uh, not, not treating it as dispatches from a foreign planet, but, uh, you know, Oklahoma, writing about Oklahomans for Oklahomans uh, resonates. Thanks. Yeah, I'm glad. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Mike. Anything else? Okay. Well, yeah, if you guys need anything, definitely get in touch. Um, and uh, I, you know, just in my capacity as a board member, I'm always happy to help you out and, uh, and check out the resources page on our website. I think you'll find it helpful. So, yeah. well, and let's continue to think about partnerships with tribal media as we embark on this project. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.